Hey guys, Greg here, Bone Tactical. In this episode of Cigar Stories with Mr. Bone, I'm gonna share with you what it's like to deal with Latin American gangs like MS-13 from personal experience. I'm gonna share some stories with you and I'm gonna really just crazy stories like you guys like have been requesting this an awful lot. And I'm also gonna try and share a few tips about how you can deal with these gangs as well. And you might say, but Greg, those are Latin American gangs that are from Latin America. They're actually not. If we're talking about MS-13, it was started in California within the prison systems with some gentlemen from El Salvador. Okay, that's why they call it Mara Salvatrucha. It's uh, MS-13. And then their biggest rival would be Calle 18. That's the 18th Street gang. And that's kind of where we're going to use. That's the two biggest gangs I've had the most direct experience with. And they're also the two biggest gangs all across America. So it's not just Latin America, guys. These are the gangs that you're going to be facing <clears throat> if you have some kind of Latin American gang involvement. And you might say, well, I'm a, an upstanding business person in the U.S. Man, uh, these gangs are taking over everywhere. All across U.S. cities, they have a stronghold. So... It might, you might have a run in by chance with these people and, and this video will really help. If not, then I'm just gonna provide some great entertainment value for you guys. So I'm gonna start off and I have to start off with this, a little disclaimer for you guys. Anything that I say in this video, anything that I am giving reference to is purely for the purposes of entertainment value. I am not admitting involvement in any crimes. And I cannot and will not say anything that will incriminate me or that can be used against me in the court of law for any crimes, domestic or international. All right. So if I use the word friends, all right, please be very aware that I use the word friends in this video in a capacity that can refer to anyone from an associate to an acquaintance to a client in private security contracting, or to a friend in the general and most commonly used sense of the term. The people and places in this video, I am not going to share specifics of names, never will. So for those who I've worked with in the past, please be aware that although I am sharing these stories, you have complete anonymity and you always will, all right? Uh, will not share people in places and I will not share specific information that could allow anybody else to be arrested for any crimes. So those of you that may be watching this trying to gather some information to use against me, I'm just going to let you know right now that's not going to be shared anything like that in this video. As far as the cigar goes, let's get started on that. I have really nothing better than a Monte Cristo memory. How perfect for this occasion. <laughs> this is a mild smoke, mild to medium smoke, coming from, I believe, the Dominican Republic. Let me double check here. This is, uh, they have, uh, yep, La, La Romana Dominica Republic, Republica Dominicana, or Dominican Republic. So, memories, obviously, we're <laughs> sharing cigar stories, so couldn't be uh, more appropriate in any way. And it's just a nice little cigar. So, you know, being that I'm trying to tell a story that you guys don't have to bear with me just sitting and smoking the whole time. So I'm just gonna jump right into it and get out, starting out the gate with some really cool stories, crucial information for you guys. And the first thing I'm, first, first, first thing I'm gonna do is dispel a myth. And then I'm gonna share some behind the scenes stories letting you guys know actually how gangs operate versus how people think they operate. So what most people think is that these gangs are just, th that the main threat is just extreme violence and that's it. So like any random person can be maybe like assaulted or, you know, you have to be prepared with your firearm and at all times ready to shoot one of these guys if they try and attack you or rob you. But that's really about as far from the truth as it can get, believe it or not. It's, it's actually not how these gangs operate. They're actually very intelligent in the sense of being adaptable and using ingenuity, using what they have to their benefit. 
they're not at the, especially in Latin America, in, in, in the United States now they have a lot more access to a lot more firearms, a lot more money, a lot more technology. But in Latin America, the base levels of these guys, and sometimes the whole entire organization, depending on what city or what country it's in, they're very limited as to what they have access to. They're not like a multi-million dollar organization. They're not five Fortune 500 companies until you get to the big cities. Then everything's very different. The real danger with these gangs is actually letting them get a foothold. And they use a lot of interesting methods, and I'm gonna share two methods that are exact examples of how they get their foot in the door when dealing with people, and how being what we think of as the sheepdog really actually is not good prevention. And, well, it's not gonna save you because these guys are, especially in the US, they're ready for that. And, and, and outside the US, really everywhere, they're a little smarter than that. So what they do first always is they either gather information, A or B, they get their hooks in somehow. And it's really almost always the two together. They're gathering information, so they're selecting people. So the real gray man theory that I teach is incredibly important because you can, first off, prevent being selected as a person of interest by these gangs because they're not picking random people to do violence to. These gangs, they have really a network and they, they are infiltrated into the communities where they operate. And their biggest, in Latin America, their biggest financial gains, the, the way that they're making the most money is through extortion of honest people, local business people. They charge what they call a war tax and I'm gonna give you some examples of how the extortion starts exactly. Tell two different stories that really will blow your mind because they're much more intelligent than what you think they are. So your preparedness comes much before the fact. It doesn't come from carrying a firearm. It comes from the way you operate on a daily basis, the pursuit of excellence with the principles that I teach, such as gray man theory versus being a hard target, you guys have seen all those videos. That's one video I filmed was directly riding around, fully kitted out, and putting up a presence, basically, and directly fighting against the gangs, let's say. Direct front lines against gang activity, protecting a property and a farm with high value assets and high value targets. So I talked about that and how we did that there and how better ways to do it in different areas, right? So we need to realize first that extortion is the first thing that these gangs will try. And then it's not just extreme violence off the bat. It's them working their way into your life. So be a person that isn't worth the risk for them to attack or for them to target, let's say. Now, I'm gonna, the two stories I'm gonna start with and I'm gonna share a wealth of stories and then how it can ap apply to you in this video. The two stories I'm gonna start with are both extortion attempts from the very first, how it started with extortion attempts. Okay, so I have a friend of mine Remember, the term friend that I use is in reference to the beginning of the video where I defined the term friend for legal purposes. So I have a friend of mine who has been attempted to be extorted by gangs for many years. They, these gangs, they, they come and go because they're just they're violent gangs fighting for control. This friend of mine operates in many countries, several, let's say several countries. He has businesses, legitimate businesses, very big time businessman throughout Latin America and Europe. And this gentleman, more times than I can count, has been attempted to be extorted by gangs. Now, these gangs are not as strongly affiliated as you think, and we'll get more into that. MS-13 in one city in El Salvador, could be a different MS-13 that doesn't even know the people 
from a different city. It's possible. So they aren't as tightly networked as you might think. First, you need to know that. So this gentleman has dealt with every city that he has a business in has been attempted some form of extortion. And being able to share this exact, these exact ways that they attempted to extort him directly applies to you. So if you have a business, you know, or even if you have a nice house and a nice car, then when these gangs or any real group of individuals, this could apply to a, you know, apocalypse scenario when the rule of law is removed from the situation. This is human nature. It's not something only Latin American gangs do. So this knowledge experience is a treasure. It's, it's beyond value for those of you who haven't had to go through this and survive this. And many people haven't survived this and had to learn the hard way. And then, you know, by not living, <laughs> not literally not surviving. So two completely different situations. The first one through threat of physical violence is when these guys have extreme, extreme, extreme control and they feel invincible in an area. And that's happened recently. And I'll explain to you the dynamic of that here in a second. But the first extortion attempt, and this is very classic, they'll send you a cell phone, right? It could be your business or your house, could end up in your mailbox. It could be delivered by courier. They'll send you a cell phone. They have to contact you. It could be a letter. It could be an email. It could be a text message. But in this case, they sent this gentleman because he's obviously a high value target, you know, massive business owner, extremely successful. So they sent him a, a, a telephone, a smartphone, just for them to communicate with him. Uh, this guy is slicker than owl poop, as we say in the South, and uh, <laughs> he does not uh, mess around. He, you know, he, he knows what to do. He immediately disposed of the phone. No contact with him, right? He's got layers in his organization where n nobody off the street can just contact him. So that's what we can take from that is that's probably the most important thing. If you don't have the ability to insulate yourself, and that's actually what I have to do, is have layers of ways that I can't let people contact me directly when I'm in a Latin American country because of the threat is so extreme of them having contact with the person directly. And this is not a threat that you would experience as a traveler or a tourist. This is only a threat that you would experience as an established local business person. So they sent them a cell phone. They try various means of contacting him. And then the ultimate thing there is a bullet with his name inscribed on it. At that point, you get the message that this is when a gang has extreme control in an area. They try this method. At that point, you get the message that they're going to start you know, blowing up your businesses, burning down your businesses, shooting up your businesses, killing or kidnapping your employees. At the point with, where you get the bullet, that's where all that stuff starts. Now, uh, I, you know, I was um, allegedly working with this gentleman at this time, and my recommendations to him, as far as the, there's two aspects, right? There's cut the, the head of the snake off, and then there's defend the home, defend the, the, defend the base, right? defend the base of operations. So my recommendation to him was put at least one armored vehicle at every one of your businesses and have that as the immediate threat response because an, arm, an armored vehicle, if somebody pulls up and starts shooting, that's going to be a mobile area that you can, that's defensible. Then I went through with some contractors and some designers and we built actual beautiful looking structures around the outside of these buildings that were defensible for the security team. Um, of course, we're talking multiple armed guards, training for the guards, everything like that. So that was the recommendation for the home front. but. You know, the at that point, you're just per, trying to be prepared for when something happens. And, and, and this is the old mafia tactic of, hey, uh, 
let me offer you protection. This is a dangerous area. So this is the most common way. Hundreds of people, this is what happens to them. Public transportation in Latin America. I could tell you so many stories of public transportation. What the gangs, the gangs have absolute control of all public transportation. They charge what they call the war tax. And so they first, they, they, they contact the owners of the tra public transportation, buses, taxis, all that kind of stuff. They pull them out of the cars or the buses, the people that are in them. First, okay, first they contact them and they're like, hey, you got to pay this. If they don't pay that, they give them like a, a it depends on the country, but there, there's like two or three warnings, one or two warnings, depending on the situation and how the person feels. But let's say the first time that they don't pay the war tax, they stop the buses, pull all the people out of the buses and set the buses on fire. You, I've got Instagram stories and videos and stuff and uh cars burning, you know, taxis on fire. That's what happens all the time. The second time that they do that, that, that they don't, that the owner doesn't pay, then they kill everybody inside the bus also, or the third time, you know, but that's the general progression, right? It gets more violent, right? So for business owners, they, they basically, the most normal is offering, hey, this is a dangerous area, but I can help. I run this area. I can protect you. If you listen to me, if you do what I tell you, if you pay this little bit of tax, nothing will ever happen to you. But, you know, hey, it's, it's a dangerous area. I don't know what could happen. So they're not actually threatening you. Is That's how it usually works. So you might, and I'm giving you both extremes of the spectrum. I'm going to give you a third example at the end of this bullet point of how the most smooth or suave way that they, they enter into trying to contact you. But this is the most extreme and this is this this way only occurs when they have complete control of the area and they feel no pressure from the government. Rule of law has completely crumbled. So I'll tell you also why this was possible. Talking a little bit about local government and history. Some people have asked me about that in the comments as well. On the last video I did similar to this. So the most standard way that a gang would approach you for extortion is just trying to offer some type of protection. And that happens all throughout the United States, right? Uh, was very popular with the mafia, construction companies, all that kind of stuff. You know, garbage truck, all that typical stuff. But they'll try and, you know, offer you a, a protection service. What they're really doing is threatening you that they're going to do damage to you or your family if, if you don't comply. Now, at that point, it's almost impossible to prevent that. So I said that I'm going to try and do some defensive stuff, and that's good. But it's really almost impossible to defend yourself against those guys once they have their hooks in. So what you want to do is prevent them from getting their hooks in. Now, in this particular case, with this particular gentleman, we also had to do another tactic at the same time as preventing our home base. We knew that we were too far along and too advanced with this gang to not respond at the same level, at minimum the same level, but really the net, the minimum necessary requirement at this point, receiving a bullet or a threat, now you have to respond with violence of a higher caliber and It's recommended that you are swift, decisive, and violent with the element of surprise in your favor at eliminating, eliminating this gang completely now. Now you have to do sufficient damage to where they can't continue to function. And that's your real only chance at survival at this point without receiving heavy damages. Because if you enter into back and forth going to war with these people, these people are very smart on how they get in, and they're very stupid at how they fight. They are not afraid to send some of their low-level soldiers who get drunk or high and go unload AK-47 magazines anywhere they want them to. So there's almost always going to be casualties if you let it get to this point, and if you don't then take decisive and offensive action at eliminating the threat. So the idea is don't let it get to that point. Now, the other method that I've seen is these gentlemen will walk into your business, especially this is only for people who have very successful businesses, so this might not apply to everybody here, but they'll walk into your business with a bag of cash. It could be $100,000, it could be a million dollars, 
usually US dollars, oftentimes $100 bills, but sometimes not, depending. Uh, a lot of times the, the, the more broken parts, you know, the smaller operating gang units, it'll be 20s or, you know, okay. So why is it US money in these foreign countries? Well, they're looking for somebody to launder their money. But that's a way that, another way that they get their hooks in. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that. Somebody walk in with a bag of cash and say, hey, I I'm looking to invest in your business. I want to be a business partner, blah, 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 whatever they want to say. They're looking to get you to launder their money. And then once they have their hooks in, then they're going to be gathering information the whole time, looking for ways to blackmail you, finding out where everybody lives that you know, how to kidnap people, because then they have their hooks in, they can do whatever they want. They're going to paint this beautiful picture. They're going to look like businessmen. Um, now I'll give you a little bit of history of these gangs. Okay, awesome. Calle 18 and MS-13 have always been the big Latin American gangs. Calle 18 is 18th Street in English, and they've been actually the famous ones for being the most tattooed, full body tattooed. Tattooed craziness, okay? And um, that stopped a long time ago. This, people don't realize this, but that stopped a long time ago, like 10, 15 years ago, they stopped tattooing themselves. Why? Well, Honduras y El Salvador, El Salvador is where they're from. Originally, Honduras, now they're everywhere. But the current president or dictator, whatever you want to say, of El Salvador is going so crazy against the gangs that these people just get killed on sight. Now, Juan Orlando Hernandez was the president of Honduras, like, for a long time. He was also maybe president slash dictator. He's now in an American prison for the rest of his life, right? He was working with the U.S. government. Um, I gotta probably be careful what I say exactly about this. But, um... As long as the drugs that he was importing into the United States were within the bounds of his handlers, I, I guess I could say, <laughs> then he was okay. But let's just say that, you know, at a certain point he was extradited, took him to a U.S. prison, and, and now he's in, you know, in prison for the rest of his life. He was literally the president of Honduras. Now he's, he's gone. So, one thing that he did do very well, uh, because of his relations with the U.S., he was very tight with the U.S. He, the only U.S. military base in all of Central America was in Honduras. They, the U.S. military, hand-in-hand, -hand works with Honduran Special Forces, trains them, everything like that. So, very close relationship. Uh, obviously, he pissed somebody off, and then they stopped liking him, and they, and they put him in, you know, how crazy is the, the, the strength of the U.S. government to be able to go over to foreign countries, arrest their presidents with no, what, zero resistance and put that person in prison for the rest of their life. So that's nuts. But um, because he was working with the U.S. and at the same time that, that president slash dictator of El Salvador made it very, very difficult for these gangs to operate. So both of these countries put the military in charge of these gangs and they went around and they were just shooting anybody in the face with gang tattoos. So they were just being eliminated. And then we could see the spike in all of these people going to the U.S. because they just they could not even be seen in public or they would be killed. So it went from, you know, 20 years ago, these people were just everywhere, super gangster people, full bodies tattooed running things, nightclubs, businesses, and people, they just, people would just put their head down when they ever, they saw a guy like this because they were that dangerous and had that much control, to then the, the, the presidents of these two countries just going through and taking all these people out. And that's another reason why so many of them went to the United States. Uh, so they stopped tattooing themselves a long time ago because of that, so especially Calle de Esiocho that was the famous for having tattoos. Everybody thinks MS-13 is the got the most. But Calle de Esiocho was the were the real gangster-looking guys from the beginning. Um, 
But now these guys show up looking like Fortune 500 businessmen when they go to charge their extortion with suits and ties. And I'm talking about in cities like San Salvador, San Pedro Sula, Tegucigalpa, Managua. This is how these guys, uh, Ciudad Guatemala, this is how these guys show up when they go to charge their war tax, literally driving a nice car, not too nice, but well put together and literally looking like the cream of the crop pillars of the community is how they now show up. So these guys aren't stupid as what people think they are. Now, what happened most recently is that when that president from Honduras got put in U.S. prison, of course they needed a new president, so they put a new president in power. They, you know, like I say, they work very, Honduras works very closely with the U.S., so everything was arranged to where there wouldn't be a power vacuum, you know. The, the, there was a, there was an election that, you know, and, I, and, and I'm going to say, you know, allegedly, because I, I have friends, acquaintances, people that I know who worked with the computer systems for the elections of Honduras. <laughs> and um, let's just say that when you have a computer system that's running the election, it's a, com a computer program that the per the people running that program can count the votes the way they want to. Okay, so it was arranged so that Juan Orlando Hernandez, the president, lost an election and he immediately was another person was put in power that was a, 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 a the lady president that's president now, Ziomara, and then uh, Juan Orlando was put in prison. Okay, very, very, very crazy. Uh, probably maybe nobody knows this as far as uh, people that are making videos on YouTube. So uh, do some research, guys. Look it up. Uh, really, just you, your, your brain will go down, the, uh, go down the rabbit hole on this one. <laughs> but we've got uh, everything done to be possible to prevent the power vacuum, but there was a change in government. And this new president, Ziomara, actually took the military out of control in the anti-gang war. So she put the police force in charge of gang control, and now the military that was doing a very good job controlling the gangs in Honduras was no longer allowed to do that. They, put on, they were given other tasks. And immediately the gangs corrupted the entire police force of Honduras. They got them on their payoffs. The police didn't have a chance. They didn't have the history. These other people had years. The military had years of experience. There's much less corruption in the military than there is in the police force in these countries. And the gangs just took over the country like that. And it became extremely dangerous. In my last video, we talked about how this sudden rise of gangs, these ga gang bangers, and uh, started eliminating the narcos, which the narcos had total control during Juan Orlando, and then now the gangs are taking over because it's just unchecked violence everywhere. The country went from being a little bit stable, still the most dangerous country in the world, um, potentially, to then being, in the last two years, Honduras has really just been crazy all over again, like it was back when San Pedro Sula was the murder capital. But uh, then, you know, she eventually put the military back in control to fight against the gangs, but it's almost too late. Uh, it's just, uh, it's wild, wild west right now. And they're trying to fight and gain power back and everything like that, but the gangs have just adapted tremendously. So uh, that whole first group of stories, and there's going to be a couple more groups of stories, that whole first group of stories was to let you know that the importance and the way to deal with these gangs is to not let them get their hooks in. All right, so the, the government let these gangs get their hooks in, and then when and and you know certain cities let these gangs get their hooks in and then they're just incredibly hard to eliminate it's like a plague and when you do dedicate yourself to eliminating them you you can't play by rules that will limit you because these gangs don't play by any rules you have to just we talked about violence of action the element of surprise and just going way overboard matching their intensity and and really going exceeding their intensity 
And uh, when we talk about, you know, intensity, we're talking about people that have no qualms about kidnapping and killing and dismembering bodies and torturing people and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, there's some other videos here uh, where I actually filmed the videos in uh, a former MS-13, what they call Casa Loca, Crazy House which is where they do their tortures and, and they, they just do drugs and, and get drunk and have parties and, and cut up bodies and paint with on the walls with blood. And, and these people are just sick. They're sick puppies. So, you know, uh, don't let them get their hooks in. Now let's get into the second group of stories. Please, if you like these videos, take a second right now before I get into this second group of stories to comment below and share this video with a friend. So... I can keep these videos coming. You know, I'm a very busy person these days making the world's most effective edged weapons, non-permissive environment gear like the clothing line. You guys know all of the innovative stuff that I'm doing in the tactical community. Also, the outreach programs where I'm trying to make the world a better place. And, you know, making these videos, if they're not having an impact, I'm going to have to stop making them. The last one had a great impact. Tons of comments. But take this as take a second, please share this video with a friend, send it via text message, WhatsApp, whatever you use, post it on your social media, just copy paste the link in Facebook, whatever. It helps me be able to keep these videos coming because there's a cost involved, guys. My time is extremely valuable these days and I have to be able to make this video at least cover my expenses. You know what I mean? Um, and I don't think that should be a problem. If all you have to do is comment and share, uh, and you're getting all of this wealth of information for free, I think that's plenty fair. So I just realized this is getting very long-winded. Probably gonna have to make a part two of this, but it seems like uh, this has you know, been pretty much a long enough video uh, for some great information and, and to do two parts of it. Make sure to tune back in for part two of this video where I'll share some more intense stories even. So if we get to the point in the U.S. where gangs are this powerful or where we lose the rule of law, what you can take from this is don't let them get their hooks in. And if you have to, if you find yourself in a situation where they have access to your information or you're, they're in communication with you, you have to figure out a way to eliminate them and go full go full stop, whatever you want to call it, the whole nine yards, you have to put yourself in there. Unless you want to shut down shop and move to another place and change everything, which got a really cool video on that, on uh, how to escape, how to change your who you are, how to disappear, how to... So there, that's one way to deal with gang pressure. Uh, I've got an amazing video on that, extremely popular here on the channel. You can see I've got a fake mustache in the thumbnail. Check that out. Um, how to escape a warrant, I think it's called, but it's the same with applies with how to escape anything and become a different person, so to speak. So check that out. And I hope this video helps. Again, questions, comments, and shares. Thanks for watching. Bone out.